I'm Pastor Andrew Ebanks, the lead pastor of the Agape Family Worship Center, and we hope that you will be blessed by this message and that it stirs up your affections for Jesus. We believe that God has a purpose for every person, and that's why our vision here at Agape is to love people and connect with them, leading them into a relationship with God through the life-giving message of Jesus Christ. We want to equip people to be all that God has made them to be so that we can all serve God and people to build God's kingdom. If you don't have a home church, get connected with one. We'd love to have you join us here at Agape and you can visit us on our website at www.agapecayman.ky. Enjoy the rest of this message and God bless you. Amen. Well, welcome to the final week of Made for Mondays. Uh, it's taken us a little bit of time to get here, but we have made it to the final week of Made for Mondays. We started this series uh, uh, early on in the month where we were looking at uh, just the, the way that God has called us to be as believers, as followers of Jesus and the mission that he has called us to. And, uh, and we talked about several things. We talked about the calling of God and we talked about, you know, what that looks like for each of us. And, and we talked about how, uh, what, what am I supposed to do if I hate my job? And this whole series has just been revolving around the idea of the fact that God has placed us where he has placed us for such a time as this for such a season as this, to do the work of God right where we are. Regardless of what our job is, regardless of what we do Monday to Friday or whatever our work days are, that he has called us and given us a ministry right where you are. And so, would you say this with me this morning before we begin the message? Would you say, I was made for Mondays. Look at your neighbor and tell them, you were made for Mondays. See, this whole idea has been that uh, what God has called us to is bigger than just Sunday. It's bigger than just this gathering here. It's bigger than just this group of us that are gathered in this room on a Sunday. Yeah, we come together to praise the Lord and encourage one another and, and, and to be built up around the Word of God, but it's so much bigger than this. If our faith is only a Sunday faith, then our faith is really not doing what it's supposed to do and, and what God intended for our faith to be. And so that's what this whole series is about, is getting each of you to understand that God made you to be a minister. Can you say that with me? I'm a minister. I know that for some of you that, that, that might be a little hard and that might be a little bit out of what you are used to, but that's the reality is that, you know, that's, uh, being a minister is not a part of the fivefold ministry. We've got apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers and pastors. I didn't hear minister in there. Why? Because we're all called to the ministry. Every single Christian is called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Regardless of, uh, of where you want to fall, or regardless of what your gifts are, regardless of, uh, of where in the fivefold ministry you think you may function or may not function, God has called every single believer to share the good news about Jesus Christ. Even as we're coming into Easter, we're going to be talking about the good news. I mean, we talk about it every time, every Sunday, but, but we, we're going to be looking specifically at that story of what Jesus did and how he died for our sins and how he was resurrected. And, and I, I love Easter. I'm excited about Easter. Make sure you, you come back for Easter, Good Friday, and, and, uh, as well as Easter Sunday, and bring some people with you. We're going to have a great time, I promise you. But this morning, I want to talk about faith at work. Faith at work. Not just that our faith is at work, but that our faith is present in the workplace. That our faith is present when we go to work, when we are at work, that we are sharing our faith. Because this is one of the things that's so incredible. The statistics are staggering as to how many Christians don't share their faith. But the statistics are also staggering as to those who say that if someone were to share the gospel with me or if someone were to invite me to church, that I would be open to hearing it and that I would be open to going to church with them. 
Uh, it's, it's incredible to see the statistics of these things. And so the reality is, is that we're all called to be ministers. And when I say we're called to be ministers, I don't mean that you're going to be a pastor. I don't mean that you're going to stand on this pulpit or any other pulpit and preach the good news. But you have an opportunity right where you are to be the unofficial chaplain at your workplace, to be the unofficial person that God uses to touch people's lives at wherever you work and wherever you go and whatever you do. In Romans chapter 12, we, we read, and this has kind of been the whole theme of, of what we've been talking about. In Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, it says, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, and you're walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Now, now I know that there's other translations that, 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 that probably give us a, a much better uh, Greek to English translation and all that, but I think the Message Bible here gives us a good summary of what this is trying to say. That, that we are to offer ourselves to God, that we are to come to God by his strength, by his ability, by his power, and that every area of our lives should be affected by the good news of the gospel. And that every area of our lives, wherever we go, whatever we're involved in, whatever we're doing, should be affected by the way that we live, and as Paul says here in Romans chapter 12, whether we're sleeping or we're eating or we're going to work or we're walking around life, whatever it is we're doing, that we do it, that we offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice, that we allow him to work and move in our lives. We say, God, everything that I am is for your glory. Everything that I do, I want to honor you. I don't want to do anything that will not bring honor and glory to the name of God. And that's what Romans 12 is telling us. Well, we read in, in Matthew chapter 5, and this is kind of where we're heading with, with today's message. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, we see where Jesus, he says, you are like salt for everyone on the earth. This is who he's called us to be. He's called us to be salt for everyone on the earth. I, I've got up here with me today some nice French fries. They actually smell quite good. <laughs> Anybody want some? Just kidding. I'm not giving you any of my French fries. But you know what? Jesus, here's, here's what Jesus is saying. He says, you're like salt for everyone on the earth. So he said, hey, I want you to just Add a little flavoring. That's, that's, that's good enough. Because I want you to be like that, 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 that when, you, when they taste it, when they, when they, when they come and they go, mmm, yeah, that, that was good. But here's how a lot of people interpret this. You are salt for everyone on the earth. Man, anybody still want these french fries? I don't know about you, but I don't want anything to do with these french fries now. But yet, this is how so many times we interpret what Jesus is saying. I am the salt of the world. And I don't know about you, but this is not who Jesus has called me to be. I was never meant to be this salty. Because I'm not preserving anything. I'm just destroying it. I'm destroying these fries. These are, are, are no good anymore. And it's, you, you, you ever heard someone say, and I don't always agree with this statement, but, but I've heard it said this way before, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. You know, salt isn't that bad. You know, I, I, I can't eat my food without salt, but you season in my food like this, I don't ever want you to feed me again. Is that not a good thing? Jesus says, you are the salt of the world. You have to understand what that means. That means that when you come along, the, the saltiness of your life is just going to rub off on people. You know, I was seasoning some meat for lunch last night, and, and, uh, and, and so we were, we were cooking some, we are cooking, some, uh, it's already finished. Uh, we were cooking some Cayman style beef for lunch today, and um, 
I was just there rubbing the, the seasoning on, and, and, I, and I started looking at it, and I was like, I better be careful that I don't put too much on this, because it, otherwise it'll be too salty, and then what it'll be? It'll be unedible, or inedible, or whatever the word is. <laughs> inedible. Nobody's going to want to eat it. A couple of weeks ago, Emily and I, uh, we, we made one of, it was the first time making one of my favorite dishes in the world. I'm not going to tell you what it is. And um, it, one of my favorite dishes in the world. And I seasoned it. And I seasoned the meat good. But what I didn't pay attention to was that the other ingredients, the sauce that I made to go along with it, was a salty sauce. And so even though I seasoned the meat right, I added sauce to it that also had salt in it. So we're eating it and our face is like, yeah, it tastes good. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, Emily, I am so sorry. It wasn't, it, it, it just, it, it, we were like, man. And so even though the meat was fine, when we add all this other stuff into it, you see, we don't always recognize how much salt is in other people's lives. What other people have already done, the labor of love that people have already put into other people's lives. So we come along and we're like, here, this is how much salt you need from me. And they're like, mm -mm, that's okay, I don't want any of that. Keep that away from me. And so it's important that we learn what it means to share our faith. And that we learn to be salty, but we learn to be the right amount of salt in the earth. Otherwise, it's not a good thing. You know, one of the reasons why the Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea is because of the salt content. You see, it's just dead. Salt isn't bad. Salt brings out life and flavor in the things that we eat. And as a matter of fact, it's wonderful, but nothing can live in the Dead Sea because it's so salty. And let me just tell you from first-hand experience, if you ever go to Israel and you go in the Dead Sea, don't get it in your eyes. Whew. That's horrible. Your eyes will be red for like a week. I mean, it just burns and burns and burns and burns. So even though it's a good thing, it can be used improperly. So let's be careful about our salt content. So I want to give you some tips this morning. I want to give you, share with you eight tips for sharing your faith at work. And the first one is this, is, is that work for the Lord. Work for the Lord. You see, what we have to remember is that, and we talked about this already, is that first and foremost, my boss is not my boss. Your boss is not your boss. God is your boss. He is who you ultimately work for. Now, your boss at work might distribute the work. He may tell you what it is needs to be done. He may give you the report that needs to be finished or the task that needs to get done. But ultimately, who do you work for? You work for the Lord. Ultimately, that's who you answer to. But here's the thing is that our work ethic can be a door opener for us to sharing our faith. Now, Here's the reality, is that when we have a poor work ethic, people may not be as willing to hear what we have to say. Because they know us at work. They've seen us at work. I see how they work. Why would I want to do anything with them? Why would I want to go any? Why would I want to hear anything? I, anytime they talk at work, the only thing I want to do is just close my office door because I don't want to hear them. So we don't want people to have that kind of approach to us. In Colossians 3.23, it tells us, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. He says, whatever you do. What does that mean? When you go to work, when you're eating, when you're sleeping, whatever it is you do in life, you do it unto God, not for man. You see, our, our responsibility is not to please man in any area of our lives. Our responsibility is to please God. God, have I been faithful to what you've called me to do? God, have I been faithful to the work that you have for me? You know, a poor work ethic can water down your witness. A poor work ethic can water down your witness, meaning that you're at your job and you're not doing what you're supposed to do. People may not want to hear what you have to say. So many Christians lose opportunities to witness because of the way that they work, because of the way they are at their job. So we've got to be remember, we have to remember that we work for the Lord, not for man. Now, secondly, we need to be bright. 
Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5, 14 through 16, he says, you are the light of the world. And notice that he said, you are the light of the world. Notice he didn't say that I am the light of the world. He didn't say Jesus is the light of the world. He says, you are the light of the world. You're not the source of light, but you are like a flashlight. You're able to, to, to be a smaller light in this world, that Jesus is our source. He's the one who really gives us the power to be able to, to let our light shine. But the reality is, he says, you are the light of the world. Would you say that with me for a moment this morning? You need to encourage yourself with, with the scriptures sometimes a little bit. Would you say, I am the light of the world? Look at what he continues and says. He says, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light up a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You know, we don't have to walk around boasting. We just need people to notice what we do when we're doing it, and it'll bring honor and glory to God. God says, when you do a good job, it brings honor to him. You know, at work, you are not called to be the morality police. What do I mean by that? Your job is not to be there and point out all the wrong that everyone is doing while you're at work. Man, look, look, look at you doing that. Mm -hmm, come on now, come on. Really? You got, you got to be doing that? That's not what we're called to do. That's not who we're called to be. Matter of fact, let me say it this way. Being critical is not a spiritual gift. Being critical is not a spiritual gift. But so many times that's how we, we feel, especially if it's coupled with a little tinge of superiority in it. The Bible has a word for that, and it's called pride. And it's not of God. It's not of God. That's not of God. So what God is saying to us is this. He says, I want you to do good work. I want the work that you do, the work of your hands, to be recognized as good. You know, there are so many opportunities for us as Christians to be recognized as being bright. Look at what Jesus says. He says, you are the light of the world. He says, be bright. Be bright. Look at what he says down in verse 16. He says, let your light shine. Be bright. That's what he's challenging us to do. So how, how can we be bright? Well, maybe when you go to work tomorrow, when you go to work on Monday. Hey, what did you do this weekend? Oh, I went to church and we had this incredible time at church on Sunday. You know, the pastor was preaching about, about how I was made for Mondays. And, you know, I, I'm just so glad to be here today because I get to wake up this morning and another day at life and another day to honor God. It's just something real simple. You get to just choose and say, hey, you know what? I love the Lord and I want to honor God. We went to church and had a great time. You know what happens sometimes? When, we, when we're worn out and we're tired and we come in and what did you do this week? Man, I'm so beat from the weekend. I need another weekend. I wish today was a holiday. I don't, I don't want to be here today. I just, want, I just want to sleep. That's a bad witness. That's a bad witness. You know, maybe they say, hey, well, you know, what else, what did you do this weekend? Maybe you could talk about your life group. Hey, you know, we, man, we were, I, I'm in this thing called a life group at our church, and it was incredible. We, we, we were talking about something, and, you know, God just really showed up. A life group, what's a life group? Well, that's just where a group of us get together, and we, we share our lives together, and we encourage one another. We build one another up in the faith. We, we look at the word of God, and we talk about God and his word, and, and it really just helps us to grow. As, as Christians, you know, maybe, maybe even a role change at your job. You know, sometimes when you get a, 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 a promotion or a change of position, you, you move department. Sometimes they'll bring you before the whole team and they'll be like, hey, you know, uh, what, what? so tell us a little bit about yourself. And you go, okay, uh, let me tell you about myself. And usually we're like, yeah, you know, I, I worked really hard for 30 years and, and that's how I got this position. But well, what if we took just a little bit of a different approach? And we said, you know what, my faith is really important to me. And as a matter of fact, my faith is what has developed me to become the kind of person that I am today. And as a result of that, that's why I was able to get this promotion or why this role is so important to me because my faith has helped turn me into the kind of person who works hard to be able to reach where I've reached in life. 
You give God the glory back to that. You know, what, what, what about, you know, even, even if you're in some kind of leadership position? You know, may, I, I know sometimes we're in leadership positions in organizations that, that are not Christian and, and they, they don't want us to say anything about God. And, 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 and even in Cayman, we see it happening now. People are like, yeah, you know, you can't really talk about God at work. And, and that happens sometimes. And you're in this leadership position and you're like, man, I want to share my faith, but how do I share my faith in this setting? And you know, one of the things that, that I found is just absolutely uh, incredible is how many resources are out there that are Christian that people don't know are Christian. You know, John Maxwell is one of my favorite authors. As a matter of fact, if you're dealing with anything on leadership, I always recommend John Maxwell. And he has this book called The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. And I, I read it a few years ago, and, uh, and it's, it's this really incredible book. But what's funny is, is that it's a Christian book. John Maxwell was a pastor for over 20 years, and he talks about leadership basically from what he learned as 20 year, uh, after 20 years of pastoring. Now he's this itinerant speaker that travels all over the world talking about leadership and helping people develop their nation. And everything that he talks about in terms of leadership has to do with biblical principles. He might not quote a Bible verse to tell you, well, hey, you know, John chapter 6 verse 1 says, you know, he's not gonna, he doesn't necessarily do that in all of his books. But nonetheless, you, you see how it, it would rub off on people's lives. They begin to learn these biblical principles. And it's, and it's funny because people start quoting the Bible without realizing they're quoting the Bible. It's funny when, when, when people start doing that. You know, they'd be like, yeah, you know, I heard this really interesting quote the other day. And it was like, you know, that, 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 that you should work hard and, you know, whatever. And you're sitting there listening. And that, that sounds real familiar to a verse in the Bible. And then you start telling them about it, and they're like, and they're like that's in the Bible? And be like, yeah, that's in the Bible. It gives you an opportunity to then witness to them. So we've got tons of ways to talk about the, our faith at work, even in environments that aren't necessarily that welcoming to us sharing our faith at work. You know, the third thing that we can do is be consistent. This is, this is so important, consistency. This is critical for us. Now, I know that as people, as believers, as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, we know we're not perfect. If anybody who's painfully aware of their shortcomings, I am. I am painfully well aware of my shortcomings. I know that there's a lot of things in my life that I'm not aware of, but there are things in my life that I am painfully aware of about myself that I know I am not a perfect person. But it's important, nonetheless, for us to be consistent. It's important for us to be consistent. First Thessalonians, in chapter 2, verse 12, tells us, it says, We pleaded with you, encouraged you, and urged you, live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. Be consistent. For he called you to share in his kingdom of glory. You see, the reality is that what Scripture teaches us is that Jesus died for our sins, that he paid the price that we should have paid, that he went to the cross for us, and he laid it all down for you and me. That's what he did. And we couldn't earn that. We don't deserve that. It is the free gift of God that he has given to us. But you know what Jesus wants in return? He wants us to live our lives in a way that God would consider worthy. To live our lives in a way that God would consider worthy. It's not about earning our keep in terms of salvation. It's about look at what Jesus has done for me. And because Jesus did this for me, I want to do this for Jesus. It's not, about, it's not about trying to earn our salvation or be, be worthy enough to keep it. It's about the fact that I know that I am loved without condition and that God wants what's best for me and he's put these things in my life and he is going to keep me. He's going to move in my life. And as a result of that, God, I just want to do this for you. I want to honor you with this. I want to live my life in a way that is consistent with who you've called me to be. You know, uh, a few years back, I, I, uh, I, work, I used to work for Kevin and Wireless uh, before they changed the line, before they changed the flow. <laughs> and um, while I was working there, uh, I worked there, uh, I don't even remember how long, I think it was like just shy of a year. 
But while I was there, I worked with, with several groups of people. But then when I, when I got placed with one particular guy, we just worked together all the time. And he became basically my supervisor on the job. And he would teach me and train me how to do things and whatnot. And, and, and so I worked there for, for just shy of a year, I believe it was. And uh, anyway, what ended up happening was, and I probably worked for him, with him for even less time. Probably, I probably worked with him for three, maybe four months. And so it was interesting because we worked together every day. And that was that. I left. And... I started working at the church more full-time than I had been because I was working part-time at the church at the time. And, and, uh, and so uh, it was interesting because one day we had some stuff out here that we needed to get done. And so we put in the call and the guy comes out and it's him. And it's this guy that I had been working with and I hadn't seen him since I had worked at Cable and Wireless. And he goes, you're here? And I was like, yeah. He goes, you're the pastor of the church now? And I go, Yeah. And he's like, really? And I was like, yeah, you sound surprised. He's like, I kind of am. And I was like, well, I'm not sure how to take that. <laughs> and so he, say, he says, no, he's just, you know, I mean, we work together. We work real close together for, for, for a few months. And he's like, you know, I just, I thought you were working somewhere else like this. I didn't, I didn't imagine that you had gone on to become a pastor. And, and I was like, Okay, uh, still not sure how to take that. He's like, no, I don't mean it in a bad way. And I was like, oh, what, well, what do you mean? He says, well, he says, you know, you just, it's good to see you doing something like this. It wasn't where I pictured you would be, but it's good to see you doing something like this. And I was like, oh, okay, thanks. And it, and it left an impression with me because here's what it said to me. He looked at the kind of work that I did. He looked at the kind of person that I was. And even though I wasn't at work every day preaching the gospel and going, man, you need to know Jesus. He knew about me. He knew about my faith. He just didn't expect that my faith would lead me to become a pastor. He thought I would end up doing something else. And eventually he said this to me. He says, he says I'm glad that this is what you're doing. And I'm looking forward to doing this job for you. And I was like, wow. Like, I, I worked with this guy for months. I, I never heard him say that to any client. But when he said it to me, I, 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 was, just, I was blessed. And I share that to, share this, to say this, is that people will look at our lives. Because can you imagine if I went to work every day and I was this lazy bum that didn't do anything? Imagine if I went to work every day and, 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 I, and I just, I was constantly bad-mouthing people. I was constantly doing the opposite of everything I know that I'm supposed to do. What would happen? He would have come done this job for me. He'd be like, hmm, well, I can just stay quiet and I can even talk to him. And what's funny is he had to work in my office. And so it was funny because he's sitting in my office while I'm working and he's working and we're just chatting like it was old days. I'm doing my job and he's doing his job and, and he's just doing his stuff and we're talking and laughing and having a good time just like it was when we used to work together. But we're doing what we, what we had to do and it gave me an incredible opportunity then to pray with him one day. And I was like, thank you, Lord. He didn't get saved and I'm still praying for his salvation and I'm hoping that one day, I, I don't care whether it's me or somebody else leads him to the Lord, I'm just hoping one day I'm gonna hear in our report that says he got saved. And you see, this, this is what I'm saying, that we have to allow ourselves to be the conduits through which God allows his grace and his mercy and his work to flow through us into people's lives so that they can encounter his love. And the way that we live, and by our consistency, people will see that. And when we're consistent with who we are, people, your co-workers, will notice your life. You spend more time with the people that you work with than at your own house. Because when you go home, you get home 6, 7 o'clock, depending on how late you work. You cook dinner, you eat dinner. You spend a couple hours together as a family and 10, 11 o'clock in the night, you're going to sleep. You've been home maybe four hours. You're going to sleep. Guess what? Ain't nobody, well, I can't say nobody talking in their sleep. You might be talking in your sleep, but you ain't having no conversations in your sleep. You're really not spending time together. You're just there sleeping. And then you get up and you're at home for maybe an hour or two in the morning before you got to go to work again. So 
we spend more time with the people that we work with than with our own families. And it's important that we continue to be consistent. You know, we got to be careful we're not what I call zigzag Christians, meaning that on Sunday we're over here and during the week we're over here. That we go from one extreme to another. We're like, we're like this today and tomorrow we're like this. We're over here today and over there tomorrow. And people look at our lives and they'll be like, you go to church? You're a Christian? You doing what? You an usher? You teach Sunday school? You, you sing on the praise and worship? You preach from time to time? You? We don't want that response, do we? When we want people to be surprised that we do that, but not surprised that we do that because we show them a different side of us. We want them to be surprised that when they find out, they go, yeah, I can see that. I can see that you would be doing something like that. It's important that we are consistent. You see, don't let the reason that you can't share the good news at work be because your life is bad news. Don't be the reason why you can't share the good news at work is because your life is bad news, that you've got a stink attitude, that you are always late for work, that you're the last one to show up and the first one to be out the door. That's not consistency. That's not good. Fourth thing, we need to be ready. We need to be ready. This is important. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3.15, he says, but have reverence for Christ in your hearts and honor him as Lord, be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope that you have in you. What's the hope that you have? What's the, what's the reason why you're this way? Can you give an answer? Can you answer people if they ask you about why you have this hope? Why you are the way you are? Man, we're all under all this pressure. We've got all these deadlines to meet. We've got all this stuff to do. And, and, you know, they're laying people off. And who knows, we may be the next one to be laid off. Why are you so full of peace? Why don't you seem to be worried? Why are you so different? Why do you act this way? Well, because my hope is in Jesus. He is my Lord, and, and I may get laid off with the next wave of people that they're laying off, but that's okay. Because Jesus is my Lord, and, and, and the Bible says that he would provide all my needs according to his riches and glory. The Bible says that he would be Jehovah Jireh, my provider. And so whatever is happening for me, I'm confident I have a hope that regardless of what happens, my God is going to take care of me. You see, there is this idea, there is this thing where we say, I choose to trust, not worry. I choose to obey and trust God and what he said. And I'm praying, and I know it's already happening because of the testimonies that have been coming in, but I'm praying that God is preparing the hearts of people in your workplace for you to reach those people. I'm not praying for you to invite me to come to your workplace to pray for people. I'm praying that God will prepare the hearts of people for you to reach them. Because God's called you, God's placed you into their lives for that reason, for that purpose. And let me just say this. Don't make people your target. Make people your friend. Here's why I say that. Because... A lot of times what happens is, is we make people a target and we really don't genuinely care about them. We don't really love them the way Jesus said that we're supposed to love them. The only thing we care about is getting them saved and going to church and be like, you, you, know, you, you need to know Jesus. Yeah, but you, my, my marriage is falling apart. Yeah, but you need to know Jesus. The doctor gave me a bad report, but you need to know Jesus. Yeah, like, yes, I get your point. What about if we approach with compassion? with the love of God, with prayer that we believe is powerful and works. If somebody comes and says, hey, my marriage is falling apart. Hey, I, I'm not a counselor, and I, 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 but I, I'll listen to you. Oh, what's going on in your life? I, I, I'll listen to what you have to say. And you listen for him and say, hey, can I pray for you? Why? Because you care. 
you genuinely care. You know, the doctor gave me a bad report this week. I have cancer or, or, or my, my mother just died or my father just died or, or, or something. Can I just be here with you? Can I pray for you? Can I support you during this time? Just to genuinely care for you. Because when we make people our target, here's what happens. When we get them saved, we leave them alone. We don't genuinely care about them. We don't care about discipling them. We don't care about what happens to them afterwards. It's just, oh, well, I did my job. They got saved today. Praise the Lord. Ah, I can relax now. Thank God. And that's not what God, God has called us to. We are supposed to genuinely care for you. And what's interesting is that it's been, since we've been talking about this whole idea of made from Mondays, it's interesting because some of you have been sharing with me the testimonies about how God's been putting people in your life. You're like, Pastor Andrew, I was freaking out. But yet, you took the opportunity, the leap of faith to do what you felt God called you to do. And it paid off. You see... I find it interesting that in the scripture, Jesus was known as a friend of sinners. That in the scripture, that they pegged Jesus as a drunkard. They pegged Jesus as a sinner. They pegged Jesus as all these wicked and evil things, not because he did those things, but because he was around those who did those things. Jesus was guilty by association. Jesus would be sitting down and there'd be people around him drinking and smoking and carrying on and, and Jesus, whatever it was they were doing, I don't know. And Jesus would just be there and he'd just be loving on them, sharing the good news about what God did, about what God is doing. And they couldn't understand, the Pharisees and the, and the religious leaders, they couldn't understand what is this man doing with these people? He's supposed to be a rabbi, he's supposed to be a teacher of the law, he's supposed to be separate from these people, not interacting with them. But how can the world ever be saved if we never go out into the world? How can those who are lost be found if we don't go looking for them? See, I want to do what Jesus said and follow his example and do what he did. So be ready. But fifth, be praying. Be praying. And you know, some of us just barely make it through the door at work. <laughs> 8 30 comes and it just snips our tail end off as we walk through the door. If we even make it on time. I want to encourage you to, to look at an opportunity to be praying. To show up to work early and sit in the parking lot if you have to. So just sit in your car and pray for your coworkers. Pray for your job. Pray for the day. Just make sure you put the car in park first. Uh, yesterday, Emily said to me, she wasn't feeling much. She said, pray for me, please. And I'm driving the car, and I'm holding her hand, and I go, Lord. And I went, oh. I said, Emily, I just closed my eyes. It's a good thing I, I realized I was driving. Because I'm trying to pray for her, and it's, so, it's just commonplace. You go to pray, you close your eyes. And I'm praying, and, and, and I close my eyes. It wasn't longer than a second, but I mean, man, it freaked me out. Make sure you put the car in park, okay? But pray. And just, 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 just sit in the car and park. And God, here's a simple prayer. Lord, I don't know what's happening in people's lives today, but God, I pray that you would use me to be a conduit of your love. Help me to be able to, to share your love with someone today. Help me to... Be there for maybe a coworker who's going through a tough time, that coworker who's dealing with whatever it is they're dealing with in their life. Lord, just, just use me today, and I ask you to put people in my path so that I can touch their lives. Lord, give me ears to hear what's going on. Give me eyes to see things that I wouldn't normally see. Give me a heart of compassion for those who need it. Simple. It's just a simple prayer to ask God to, to do that. And then we just follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit. How, 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 how do I know if the Holy Spirit is speaking to me? Well, let me just tell you this. The devil ain't going to tell you to do something good for somebody. He ain't going to tell you to share your faith with anybody. So when you're walking by and you go, man, you know, I just feel to go and just talk to that person or pray for that person or say something. 
guess what? We have an opportunity then in that moment to go and say, hey, everything all right? Is everything okay? Like, you look a little down today. You know, just something seems a little off. I just, I just wanted to make sure you were all right. You know, they may break down. They may start to cry. And you know what happens usually when people start doing that? We don't know how to deal with people when they're like that. So people start, oh, I'm having a heart. And we're like, no, 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 don't cry. It's okay. No, no, don't do that. Be like, hey, it's all right. I'm here for you. What's up? Talk to me. I'm here for you. We have that opportunity. You know, so much of ministry is just caring. So much of ministry is literally just caring for people. Just right where they are. Look at what Philippians tells us in Philippians 4, 6. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. God, I want to pray for this person. I'm going to pray for them for what they're going through. See, it's so important. It's so simple. And you'd be amazed at how just caring for people and loving people will open doors into their lives. So, number six, be bold. Be bold. At some point, we have to be bold enough to do something or to say something. People shouldn't be surprised when they hear that you're a Christian. People shouldn't be surprised when they hear you're a leader in the church or that you go to church or whatever, that you love God. People shouldn't be surprised at that. Look at what 2 Corinthians 3.12 says. It says, therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. You see, because I know I have this hope through Jesus Christ, I'm going to be bold in my faith. Because I know. I know the hope that I have. I know what Jesus has done. I know how Jesus loves me. I know how Jesus cares for them and loves them. And because I know about the sacrifice that was made for me at the cross, there is a boldness that is in me to be able to share the word of God with those. I'm going to share the word. I'm going to love them. I'm going to pray for them. You know, one of the scariest things, I'll be honest with you. I'll just be honest with you. One of the scariest things for me, even still to this day, is hospital ministry. Whenever I'm on hospital chaplaincy and, and I have to go to the hospital, here's the reason why. Nobody's called me. I'm going looking for people. And I'm just going to be honest with you. You walk into the hospital room, they, you don't know this person from Adam, and they don't know you. And you walk in and be like, um, uh, hi, I'm the hospital chaplain today, and um, I'm, I'm here to, uh, to uh, pray for people. Would you like prayer? <laughs> like it, it, I'll be honest, it's like one of the most awkward moments. I, I've gotten better at it over the years, but, but like something just comes over me. This fear comes over me. Like I don't know whose room I am walking into. I don't know anything about this person. I don't know what they're in here for. But it doesn't matter, does it? Because... I'm not there to figure out and solve all their problems in life. I'm there to care and be bold and to share the love of God with them. That's it. And I've found strength in that. See, you don't have to have all the answers. So, like, this is the problem. What if they ask me something I don't know? Then say you don't know. Why do we have to know all the answers? If, and if it's something, you say, you know, I know this is a, a really important question for you and that you want an answer. Here's what I'll do. I, I'll look the answer up. I'll see if I can find an answer for you. Uh, or, or, you know, I, my pastor was just talking about that on Sunday or whatever. You know, maybe you could talk to him and he would give you an answer. Or, or you know, there's one of the leaders in our church that, that knows about this and he, he'd be happy to talk to you or she'd be happy to talk to you about that. There, there, there's all kinds of options. But we so often let our fear control us. And God says, be bold. That's what 2 Corinthians tells us. We have a great hope. We have a, an amazing hope in Jesus. So we should be bold about it. Our hope makes us bold. And if it doesn't, then let me ask you this question. How small is your God? If it doesn't make you bold, how small is your God? 
Because see, it doesn't really matter because I'm not here to please man. I'm not afraid of man. I don't need to fear man because God is for me. God is with me, and I'm going to be bold for him. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Number seven, be sincere. Romans 12, 9 tells us don't just pretend to love others. We talked about this already. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. You see, the Bible says that we are genuinely supposed to love people. We're genuinely supposed to love people. Meaning that it's easy for us to look at people and say, hey man, I love you. Give them a nice church side hug. And then we go home and we rip them to shreds. That's not love. That's, that's, that's all I love. Man, I love you. The minute they ask you if, you can, if they can help, oh, I knew this would come in this way. I don't tell people in church I love them. Everybody always looking for something. Told pastor I loved him one time. He asked me to do him a favor. I don't know that I ever want to talk to the pastor again. I listen to him preach, but I don't want to talk to him. We're supposed to genuinely love people, not pretend. Can we just be honest? Sometimes we pretend that we really love the body of Christ, but there's some people that we really just don't love. We really struggle with loving them. For whatever the reason is, we struggle with loving them. But the Bible says don't pretend. Genuinely love them. But here's what it also says. It says we are supposed to hate what is wrong, what is evil, what is wicked, what is sin. We're supposed to hate that. And, and, and you know, we, we have this cutesy little phrase, you know, hate the sin and love the sinner. But let me just tell you something about this. We don't hate people. Scripture doesn't teach us that. But it does say that there are things that we do, there are behaviors that we have, there are things about our lives that are evil and wicked and that are not in line with what God wants or what God's design is. And God says we are supposed to hate those things. And let me say it even, go even further than this. We are supposed to hate them even in our own lives. Not just the lives of other people. I can't be like, well, you know, that's my sin, but your sin? No, no. We're supposed to hate all sin. We're supposed to abhor what is evil. What God says is, is not good. We're not supposed to be like, well, that's sin. It's, it's okay, you know, Patsy on your back and it's all good. No, no, no. God says we don't justify sin. We put to death the works of the flesh. See, we love people, but we don't have to love what people do. I love my children, but when they act up, I don't have to love the way that they act. I love you all as a church, but when you act up and you do things that are contrary to God's word, I don't have to love that. And it's the same for you, with me or with anybody else in this world. We love people, but I don't have to love what you do. I don't have to give permission to what it is you do. So, you know, I say this all the time. When we make a mistake, just admit it. Don't pretend. Don't pretend. When I mess up, I just be, hey, I messed up. Simple as that. I, I, I did wrong. I, I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have reacted this way. I shouldn't have said this. I shouldn't have done this, but I did it. So let's correct it and let's move forward. Let's correct it and let's move forward. Let's stop pretending. Let's be sincere. And then the last point this morning is point eight. Be confident. Be confident. You know, you don't have to have a PhD in theology to be confident. You don't have to have sat through hours and hours and hours of courses. You don't have to be able to quote the Bible back to front to be confident. You don't have to do any of those things. You know, sometimes some of the greatest things we could ever share with anyone is what God has done for me. Can you believe that God did this for me this week? Can you believe, man, God just showed up in my life in a very real way this week? He, he, he did this in my life, and I, I wasn't expecting it. I, I, I wasn't even praying for it. I wasn't even asking for it, but God, God did it. Look at what Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 13, 6. It says, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man 
What can man do to me? See, I don't have to be afraid. I can be confident because, well, I'm not concerned about man. I'm concerned about the Lord. And the Lord is my helper. Meaning that when I have confidence in the Lord, the Lord is going to help me to do what I need to do. I don't have to be afraid about it. I just trust him. I just trust him. So, so when I'm concerned about, am I going to be too salty? God, I'm going to trust you to lead me here. That I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow your Holy Spirit. I'm going to do what you call me to do. Lord, I don't want to be like this. I don't want to be too salty, but I do want to be obedient. And so, God, I'm going to do it. And let me tell you something. The first person I ever led to the Lord was a disaster. Not the person, me. Like, the whole, the whole moment was just a disaster. Like, I, I think back on it regularly, and I'm just like, oh, I'm surprised they even decided to surrender their life to Jesus. I mean, it was, it was bad. But you know what? I've learned since that. And since that, I've led many more people to the Lord, thank God. But, but I, I don't take credit for it. I, take the Holy Sp- I give the Holy Spirit credit for it. You know why? Because that moment was so bad when I led that first person to the Lord, it could not have been me. It just couldn't. It was impossible for anybody to get saved, but, but as horrible as that, that whole situation was. I mean, I was just a, a blubbering mess. And, you know, I was all over the place with Scripture, and I, I wasn't even quoting the Bible sometimes, thinking I was quoting. I was just so nervous. I was a wreck trying to witness to this person. But they still got saved, and they're still saved. Praise the Lord. But that's not me, and it won't be you either. It'll be the Holy Spirit. That's what we got to do. We got to trust God. We can confidently say that the Lord is my helper, which means what? If God is going to lead me to do something, he's going to help me do it. I see you all all have heard me say this before. God does not give us a vision without giving us the provision. He will give us what we need to advance the vision. So when he gives us the vision of that person saved, God will give us what we need for them to get saved. It's not us, it's him. We're just obedient. Simple as that. As you all heard me say in the beginning of the sermon, it's interesting, there's some statistics in the U.S. that came out and said 80% of people would attend church if they're invited. 80% of people. If we just gave them an invitation. You see, people are more ready than we realize. But didn't Jesus tell us that? That the harvest is ready but the laborers are few. You know what that means? Doesn't mean that there aren't people with the ability to harvest the harvest. What it means is that the laborers are not out in the field harvesting the harvest. See, Jesus didn't say that there weren't people, uh, that there weren't people who couldn't do it. He said there there are people who are not out there doing it. And what he wants from us as the church is to recognize that we have a harvest waiting for us at our workplace tomorrow morning when we get there. That we have a harvest in our house waiting for us when we get home. That we have a harvest when we go to the grocery store. That we have a harvest wherever we go, whatever we do, wherever we are. I always represent him and I'm always ready for what he's called me to do. Therefore, I'm going to be confident that when I'm in the store and the Lord tells me to to pray for somebody in the store that I'm going to do it. I might be nervous about it. I might be a little scared, but my confidence is in the Lord, not in me. And if I don't know what to say, then the Lord will give me the words to say. But I'm going to be obedient. And I'm going to do what God has asked me to do. And you see, seeing yourself as a minister, seeing yourself as the unofficial chaplain at your job is going to open more doors than you realize. You see, if you recognize that you were made for Mondays, it's going to change things. You know, it's interesting that in the book of Acts, one out of 40 miracles in the book of Acts took place in a religious setting. One. The rest of them happened in the marketplace, happened out there. And we have this idea that we have to come into these walls in order to see those miracles happen. But the Bible says, no, it happens out there. It happens when we're faithful out there. I'm not saying that God ain't going to do healing in here and that he doesn't do healing because he has and he will continue to. But what God really wants is for it to happen out in the world. One out of 40 
miracles in the book of Acts happening in a religious setting. And you know who that one person was? The lame man who was sitting outside the temple. So that's just me being generous. None of them happened really within a religious setting. The closest that we had was outside the temple. Didn't even happen inside the temple. It happened outside the temple. So that was just me being generous. So God's saying as you go out there, as you head out into the world and preach the gospel, he says signs and wonders and miracles are going to follow you. You. You see, you have divine appointments waiting for you tomorrow at work. Divine appointments of healing. Divine appointments of breakthrough. Divine appointments of deliverance are waiting for you when you leave church today. Are you going to meet them at that appointment? Are you going to be there and ready for what God has said? So in closing today, I want to just read one last time for you our eight ways to share our faith at work. First, that we work for the Lord. Second, that we be bright. Third, that we be consistent. Fourth, that we be ready. Fifth, we be praying. Sixth, we be bold. Seven, we be sincere. Eighth, we be confident. God has placed you in your place of employment for God, not for anyone else. And so today, I want you to know, you were made for Mondays. Would you tell yourself, I was made for Mondays. Thanks for watching today's message. We pray that this message has touched your life. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus was God's son who came and gave us that eternal life. It says that if we confess our sins, that he is faithful to forgive us of them. Jesus came so that we could have an amazing relationship with God and that our sins could be forgiven. And if today you want to say, I want to live for God and be restored to relationship with Him, then would you pray with me? God, I surrender my life to you today. I repent of my sin and ask you to wash me and clean me, empower me to live by your Holy Spirit as I follow you. Amen. If you prayed this prayer, then we'd love to connect with you about this relationship that you have with God through Jesus Christ. You can contact us at 949-2539 or through our website at www.agapekman.ky as we'd love to connect with you and help you on this journey. God bless you.